Before we begin with these scary stories, make sure to hit that subscribe button if you are brand new, as we upload some of the best scary stories and true crime content that you're ever going to hear on YouTube. Also, if you have a scary story that you'd like to share with the Creepy Fox podcast, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen. That's TCF Narrations at gmail.com. Anyway, with that said, let's get started with today's scary stories. So when I was in elementary school, one of the boys a few grades ahead of me was Kyle Dubay. I was two or three grades below him, so I didn't have much contact with him outside of recess. In the four square line, he often made it a point to stand right behind me and yank on my pigtails as hard as he could, whipping them around under the pretense that I was a horse and he was riding me. He also used to bring knives to school and would sometimes threaten some of his classmates with them when they did something to make them angry, and at one point actually pulled one on a girl. That occurred after school behind the main school building. Why nothing was officially done about it, I'm not sure, but my school, being very small, it was not known for being on top of the disciplinary side of things. There were a number of small things, the hair pulling, and just the general way he acted that led me to being uncomfortable whenever he was around. I wasn't alone in this regard. Former classmates have also expressed feeling uneasy in his presence. To my relief, he ended up moving away, and none of us heard anything from him or about him for a number of years. Until one day, he shows up in slash on the local news, having been arrested for the murder of Nicole Cable. He made a fake Facebook profile, lured her out of her house, kidnapped her, duct taped her, and left her in the back of his dad's pickup truck. His intention was to pretend to find her and be the hero. When he went back and found that she was dead, he dumped her body in the woods and covered it in sticks. They found her about a week later. I was in school when I read the article and I had to go to the nurse's office because I felt so weak, sick, and shaky. It's very disconcerting to think a murderer used to yank on my hair. He's going on trial in the next couple of days, which is what made me think about this whole thing. So to end this like everyone else does, Kyle Dubay, let's not meet again. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago by myself and with my two dogs. We were four days in, around 20 miles at least, as a crow flies by a known mountain road. I was camping at around 7,000 feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So when we got to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of a secondary mountain. It was an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put the tent up, slash, make dinner, etc. But I noticed this time was a little bit different. He kept staring up at the steep tree filled mountainside, tail straight up, and barking. Not the bark when he sees marmots, not at the excited, Oh, you guys are lucky because I'd rip you all apart if my master wasn't there. High-pitched barks. But yeah, unsure, concerned barks. Now, the day before, I'd found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago, and I myself had seen it big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. 
I decided to go climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for movement before I went to go hang my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So while still concerned, I start hiking up this steep hill to hang the bag. It was so steep I had to use the trees to balance and lean against it so I didn't go tumbling down. Before making another 5-6 to six step push to the next tree I could lean against. Anyway, I'm slowly making it up to this hill slash ridge, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about a hundred feet up the hill and I hear a whole lot of big movement about 50 feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage slobber flying everywhere type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in a matter of seconds because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try to save me in which he will most likely die and I'm stuck here. If I have to get off the hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12 to 15 foot cliff onto the boulders below, like hundreds of 5 to 20 foot boulders. So I'm feeling pretty screwed about now. Then I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at my campsite, which was just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent so she didn't wander off while I was away. So yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after, I kinda snap back to it and I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order and to call my dog back to me. Loki is his name by the way. He comes and sits against my feet as my back is against a tree so I'm kinda pinned slash stuck there for the moment, but my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there, so I let him lean against me while I tried to collect myself. This is when I realized I had completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reach up so fast to turn my lamp on, I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having some serious adrenaline dumps going on right now, so much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection off the eyes of whatever is up there. Peering. Peering. Nothing. But I had just heard something. We both did. And whatever it was didn't get away or sound like it had made it too far. I knew something was there. So I'm kind of just steadfast at this point. I need to know what is up there because I have to sleep here tonight. And, you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than to wait like a sitting duck all night. That was my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill and at one point, my dog lunches forward, unpinning me. He does a fake slash Bluff charge up the hill, about 15 feet, and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this, I finally see movement, something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon slash sunset. My dog Bluff's made whatever it was blow its cover, so I'm zeroed in. I call my dog back and silently watch, and what I make out made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about 75 feet directly in front of me, wearing not camo clothing, but some raggedy shit with a hood that blended into the environment perfectly. Actually, almost like a makeshift ghillie suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes, and his face was covered in dirt or something but I knew we were staring right at each other at that moment. So, I stare 
for what seems like minutes. No words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken up to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog back at the campsite started to bark her head off again, like she was scared, and I also had to get off that hill before total darkness, or I could be seriously hurt, slash risk dying trying to get back down. So, carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave, but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up, and look in that direction again, just to make it even more clear I saw him. Eventually, I make it down to the boulders at the bottom, and by the time I finally jump down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking. I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking just to bark. Dachshunds do that, or just barking back at my dog. But when I get there, my little dog had somehow got out of the tent and was walking around the camp growling, with her tail sticking straight out. Still trying to hold it together, I thought, okay, maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out, but I was positive that I had zipped it so the zipper slash tab openings was at the very top of the tent door, out of reach of her. So, in a mixture of being terrified, pissed off, and the feeling of needing to do something, so I reached into my day bag and pulled out my 40. I fire a single shot into the air as the sun was setting, climb into my tent without eating and lay with my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my stuff and leaving, heading back down the mountain. It sucks, it was all downhill back, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I made it to the last camp, about four miles from my vehicle. But thankfully, there were other people there. We sat around a fire they made, and I felt pretty relieved and safe. They start to tell me that they are planning to head that way where I was the night before in the morning, so I tell them my story in detail. Needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw all that. The thing that still creeps me out to this day though, is when I got home, and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on. Other people had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man was found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago, and a woman found murdered last year. Back in 2004, I worked for a popular Canadian company that sold cell phones, cable, internet, home phone, etc. I worked at a location in the city's local mall for a couple of years, and over the course of time, I got to know and build rapport with the customers that I saw regularly. There was one customer in particular that I served at least once a month. He would buy a prepaid phone with cash every month without fail. As I rang him up the second or third time, I watched him open his wallet and saw half inch thick wad of hundred dollar bills. Then it clicked. Monthly burner phones. Wads of hundos. He was a drug dealer for sure. Now the guy was genuinely a nice dude. Always polite. Knew me by name. Asked how my day was going. Etc. I enjoyed seeing him come in. I could tell you countless horror stories of the physical and verbal abuse that we endured at the hands of customers at that location, so it was just really great to get to deal with a nice person, and the commission and bump in personal sales was always nice as well. One night, I was at home making dinner, and I had the TV on in the background. My program had ended, and the station switched 
to the 6 o'clock news. As I sat down in front of the television with my food, the news station opened with a story on a murder that had happened in the city where someone had been hacked to death with a machete. Suddenly, my favorite customer's mugshot popped up, and I sat there, mouth agape, listening to the details of the story. It blew my mind knowing that I had interacted with him every month for probably a solid year. He's actually out of jail now, got an early release and everything, and while I'm sure I'm not really at risk, let's not meet again, machete killer. When I, 21 year old female, was 17 years old, I wanted to au pair, and the only place close to me that I could go to as a 17 year old was England. So I found this family, a mother with two kids, boy and a girl. I messaged them and talked with the mother, and she seemed very interested and very nice. We set up a date for me to go, and that was that. When I got to the airport, I was very confused that they weren't there to pick me up. I messaged the mother to ask her where they were, and if it would be long for them to get to me. She told me, that she was on her way and was just stuck in traffic. I thought, okay, that's fair. She told me to go to the exit and wait. Then, not long after, she told me that she was there and that she was in a blue car. I was looking around very confused since I couldn't really see any blue car there. When I finally found it, some other woman than the one I had been talking to walked out of the car toward me. The instant I made eye contact with the other woman, I got along a text message from the woman I was supposed to work for, where it basically said that her husband had come home from the country he worked in, and that they had fought because he didn't want an au pair in the house, and for some reason, she didn't want to tell me that. So, she just, air quotations here, gave me to her good friend who needed an au pair. I was very confused, and by that time, a bit scared. It all seemed very weird, as if someone was watching me and had been waiting for the right moment to send the text message. The woman seemed very friendly, but was hurrying with taking my things and putting it in her car while talking to me. I am a bit nervous and non-confrontational by nature so I didn't really know what to do or say other than just follow her in what she was doing. When it was all done, she told me that we should get going, and I told her that I wasn't really comfortable with it all. She told me that she understood that, but she really needed the help, and also only had two children at home. We had to move fast because of the place she was parked, so we got into the car and started driving out to the airport pickup spot. The second we started moving, I told her that I was very uncomfortable with this and really wanted to get out and stay at the airport. She seemed a bit upset by this and told me that sure, she could drop me off, but she had to get out of where we were because she could get a ticket for letting me out there or something. I don't know if this is true, just what she told me. We drove for a few minutes, still on the airport grounds, and we stopped a bit of a way so I could get out and call my parents. I talked to them, sobbing the whole time. I noticed that while I was talking to them, the woman was inside her car talking to a woman, the one I'd been talking to, I presume. I didn't understand the language, so I can't say what they were talking about. When I was done talking, I got into the car again, and I told her that I really want her to let me out, and she kept asking me if I was sure I didn't want to go into town with her, if I didn't want her to drop me off by the shopping center, things like that. I of course told her no, that I really want her to just let me out by the airport. She did, thankfully, and I went inside and talked with my parents. After this happened, I got some weird voice memos from her and two other people. I couldn't understand them, but
but it was very weird. My parents also tried contacting her, and she blocked them both. If you don't know, a lot of au pairs are being treated very poorly, so for us to feel safe and secure, ensure that we don't get cheated out of pay or working more than we are allowed, we have to sign a contract. Later on, I found out that the contract she had sent me was fake and not really binding. I don't know how, but it wasn't legitimate. Plus, her addresses she had sent me were also fake as well, and she apparently didn't live there either. I found out later on that the city I was in was a bit of a hotspot for trafficking. I didn't know this until later after this had happened. A lot of very sketchy stuff. I might be overthinking this one. It might not be as bad as I think it was. But in the moment of it, I was sure something was going on. Edit. Thank you all for your incredibly nice messages. I can't tell you how much I appreciate hearing that I'm not the only one thinking that this was all very sketchy. Edit. Number 2. A lot of people seem to be confused as to why I got back into the car again. I'm sorry, we had driven a bit away from the airport to some hangars, or whatever you call it, so I could get out of the car to call my parents. While I was out, I was only about 3 meters away from the car, and the door was still ajar so I could hear the woman speaking on the phone. When I got back in, she was still talking with her, but hung up after a minute or so. She had the lady on speaker, so that is why I could hear her. I asked her to drive me back to the airport, and that was then when she tried convincing me to let her drive me into the city, but I told her no. As I've said in the comments, I now know how dangerous this could have been, getting back into the car with her, but I felt some sort of security that both my parents and four OG friends in the same city I was in knew what was going on. She drove me back to the airport parking lot so I could get on one of the buses to go back since she would have had to pay to go back in. I hope this clears up any confusion. My husband Jim and I own an antique business in a big old bizarre barn of a building. Five floors, multiple other tenants, including a restaurant as well. Halloween was a Monday last year. We locked up the business at 5 p.m. and we went to an early dinner across town. Then we got a call from Sonatrol, our security monitoring company, at 6.30. A motion detected on the lower level. Then another. We left in a tearing hurry, but figured it's a bird or a rat. We don't have rats though, but you know, something. Maybe a cat. It was way too early for a break-in after all. I went inside the main level upstairs and disarmed the alarm and started fumbling noisily with the keys and the big iron gate, one of many that separate the floors at night. Jim checked the perimeter outside for signs of a break-in. Nothing. Doors and windows were intact. Definitely, absolutely a bird, or a rat, or a cat. Dusk was long gone. The shadows had settled in and taken over. Just as wardrobes loomed in the dark. Wardrobes and nothing more, right? I headed down below to the location of the alarm trusting Jim would follow. After all, it was a rat, or a cat, or a bird. I am accustomed to the building after dark, so I just turned on my phone light, not the overheads, and walked around boldly like I owned the place. I looked at the corner with a motion detector. Nothing, just its red eye blinking mindlessly at me. No rats, no cats, no birds. I turned and went the other way, while Jim poked around a few aisles over. And there it was, a burglary kit sitting in the middle of the floor. Bolt cutters, a fire extinguisher, just 
sitting there, waiting. I have never gotten a larger case of sheer terror so fast. After all, there was no broken window or door. So, that meant he was still there, in the dark, with me. I hissed, Jim, 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 please, and he didn't hear me. I literally couldn't scream, just like in those stupid god dang dreams. My voice stuck. Just me, the spot with the burglar tools, and a hostile presence lurking in the dusty shadows, watching while I whispered for someone to save me. Finally, a thousand years, or maybe ten seconds later, Jim wondered why I'd taken root in the hallway and came to see me. He saw what I was frozen pointing at and was like, oh shit. We bolted out the front door to call 911 and wait, and we abandoned the building to the burglar. An eternal five minutes later, the police showed up and were initially pretty unimpressed with our find of the crowbar as well as fire extinguisher. That's until we pulled up the security footage that revealed the actual horror, the face of my new sleep paralysis demon. This guy, as is obvious, he is built like a lean, mean, brick shithouse. He'd crouched on a landing behind a bookcase when we closed and watched me and my staff lock up, bided his time, then calm as he could, he walked out and went to the men's restroom in the hallway downstairs. That area isn't set for motion detect for a variety of reasons. He spent a while in there moving around with the door open. He constructed the mask using one of ours and a fake flower wreath to hold it on. Purple plastic clematis. He looked right into the camera barefaced and then put the mask on, stared at it fixedly in his mask for a time, and finally pulled his gloves on. He stacked a few solid body vintage suitcases in front of a tall iron gate and hopped right over it like it was nothing. He ran down the hall, triggering the 630 silent alarm, and looped the floor. He ran back into the hall and moved a ladder to hop back to the other side of the gate and, bizarrely, just repeated this whole thing a few times. Then he went to the basement, wormed over a 15 inch gap over yet another iron gate. He went back to the hall again, stared into the camera more, repeat. He was moving fast up and over, back and forth, upstairs and downstairs, parkour style almost. Then he got the tools out and peeled apart one of our steel lock boxes with the crowbar and stole a handful of our keys to access showcases. At this point, he heard me fumbling with the gate and keys upstairs. He ditched the stolen keys and tools and hid, watching me while he waited in the dark. We exited to call 911 and he ran back to the basement. In the basement, there is access to a dirt tunnel that circles the perimeter of the building. He broke the door open and entered. Spiders the size of dinner plates live in there. He had no light. It's muddy and dank. It's, in a word, petrifying. There is a tiny exit hatch if you walk the whole thing and take the multiple turns that dumps you into the busy kitchen of a restaurant, whereupon one would need to stroll past the line cooks out into the restaurant proper with cameras and then one could leave their front door, plastered with mud which does leave tracks. Speaking from experience, when we found it, there was as clear entrance into the tunnel but no exit tracks, no muddy footprints, nobody walking out onto the restaurant cameras and the cooks noticed nothing. It was a busy night though. Reviewing the footage, 
timing it all, tracing its path from camera to camera, and searching the building carefully took hours. By the end, all of us, including the police, were starting to lose our collective cool and freak out. There was no chill when even the guys with guns were rattled. After all, where the hell did he go? Jim and the two officers had no choice but to walk the dirt tunnel. The cops took one look and were like, absolutely not. Jim insisted and so they made him walk point. They made it about half the tunnel before the cops were like, hell no, you are leaving with us and we're gonna review more footage from the restaurant where there are no spiders and screw this. Jim got the okay from them to board up both ends of the tunnels, which he did solidly. And thus, the story ends. The pictures got spread wildly, but we got no useful leads, despite the decent face shot. Did he indeed crawl out a hatch in the busy kitchen and stroll out past the cooks, leaving no trace of mud? I guess. We got no suspicious smells coming out of the tunnel in later weeks and months, but nobody has walked that far side since. We only onboarded the tunnel last week for the split water main shenanigans. I have vowed I will use his skull in this year's Halloween display if he's dead down there. A story on here reminded me of the time some friends and I stayed in what had to be the third most shady hotel in Vegas, which, for Vegas, is saying something. When I managed to inadvertently traumatize the entirety of my company as I recounted what I considered to be an amusing childhood story. The hotel itself was a bit of a nightmare as everything was bolted down and none of the doors locked. But I digress. I decided that this would be a good place to put it, given the input of my buddies. Sorry that it's long. The story itself is about my family's run-in with Satanists on a trip to upstate New York. Though the growing expressions of disbelief and horror on my companions' faces assured me that the story was not, as I had previously considered, funny, per se. In any case, what follows is completely true, and everyone present swears by this narrative. When I was five years of age, we took a road trip, as was common in our family, up to upstate New York to see my grandmother on my father's side, as well as to tour around the countryside a bit. There we were, in rural upstate, away from the region in which my grandmother actually lives and we were planning on staying in a bed and breakfast that my father had booked ahead of time. It had been an unexpectedly long drive due to the weather complications, and when we found the B&B in question, we were all quite tired. We went up to the door to check in, and a woman missing her two front teeth on both jaws answered. She invited us in, but warned us that they didn't have any room for the night. They were booked solid. My father protested that he had made the arrangements in advance, but she said she knew another hotel that had a vacancy just up the way and she would give them a call, and said she assured him that they would offer the same rates. But first, she insisted on showing my parents around, as her husband was an artist and she wanted to show them his studio, as well as famous artwork. We were all invited in. But after seeing the first few pieces of naked women missing their front teeth, bound or being tortured in various ways, my parents opted to leave the kids outside with grandma. Apparently, most of the rooms were full to the ceiling with similar foreboding images of dead or dying people with the occasional sculpture of menacing animals. My parents were a bit creeped out but just figured these people were eccentric and they had dodged a bullet by ending up somewhere else. We all waited out back while the woman called her friend beside a pit containing what could have been nothing other 
than an altar covered with pentagrams. My mother mentioned that it seemed strange that not only had they not met the husband, who was supposedly there somewhere, having toured the entire house, but that there hadn't been a single sign of life or piece of luggage, suggesting that anyone else was actually staying in any of the guest bedrooms in this supposedly fully booked B&B. A side note that's probably not worth mentioning, but that I'd found strange when my mother brought it up with me while telling me the story later. As I was five at the time, a lot of this story has been narrated to me after the fact by different people who were involved on some level, was that we stopped by a park to stretch our legs at some point before proceeding to the next place. The storm was closing in on us, and my parents wanted to be sure we had zero energy upon arrival. While in this park, my mother claims that one of us found and brought to her a small necklace with a pendant on it. The pendant itself was a pentagram on one side with a Third Reich symbol on the other. My mother took it away and put it in her purse. We arrived at the next bed and breakfast to be greeted by a different woman, also missing her two front teeth, upper and lower. It was about this time that my grandmother mentioned that she had read a lot of articles recently about tourists being killed by some cult of Satanists or some such in this area. Great. She tended to tell a lot of tall tales, so I think my parents kind of rolled their eyes and dismissed it, but they made a point to mention it later. The storm was now upon us. We were all exhausted, and there was nowhere else to stay that we could find anywhere else near there. My dad decided we would make do with whatever they had to offer. What they had to offer was slightly renovated barn. During the bustle of moving our luggage in, the woman kept inviting my brother, three, and I into the house, saying she had some sweets and wouldn't we like to meet her kitties. She made it clear, however, that my parents were not welcome into the house because it was too messy and she would be too embarrassed. We were herded away into the barn and told not to talk to the lady. Once inside, my father, who was by this time a bit creeped out, went about checking the beds and securing the one-room barn unit. The windows had no coverings whatsoever, and the doors had no locks. We placed pillows from the couches in the window frames, and my dad grabbed a dresser against one wall to block the door. When we went to move the dresser, he discovered it was on wheels, which were completely silent. He also noticed that the wall behind it moved a little when he shifted the dresser. When he scrutinized the wall, he found a seam. He pushed on the wall, and it gave way. Two invisible doors opening outwards into the night, and just outside was a dark colored van which had been backed up to the opening. Livid, my dad went about rearranging all the furniture in the room, stacking the heaviest against the outward swinging doors and moving the mobile dresser with various loud objects behind it against the main door. When he had completed this and we were all starting to settle down at about 11 p.m., the woman brought us fresh-baked blueberry muffins. Now, as I mentioned before, I don't remember much of this trip, but this is one element I have a vivid recollection of. With the not-so-great weather and the rush to find a place to stay, complemented by the lack of restaurants, nigh anything in the area, we hadn't had what one might consider a proper meal. When you're five, dinner is very important. The muffins were fresh baked and smelled heavenly. I wanted one more than I wanted anything else in the world. However, presuming, probably correctly, that they were poisoned or something, was seriously wrong about them too, since this entire thing was beginning to feel like a horror movie. My mother absolutely forbid us from even going near them. She put them on a high shelf 
and then sent us to bed. I was so angry, I went to bed hungry and irritable. Only two things happened that night that I can recall. My parents slept very lightly, when at all, as you might imagine. They claimed they kept hearing talking outside. My sister woke us all with a blood-curdling scream around 1am, for reasons unknown, as she was usually a very quiet baby. When my parents got up and milled for about an hour trying to get her back to bed, my mom noticed something on the wall as she was walking her around and called my father over. What I would later learn was that the picture hanging to one side of the door, that during the daylight seemed to be logs in a recently extinguished fire pit and a tranquil forest scene, was by night unmistakably burning corpses with a hooded smoky figure looming over them. We got up the next morning, packed up early, and waited for the lady to get up so we could pay and leave. While my parents were packing the bags, the woman came around back and gave both my brother and I small wooden cats carved into the form of napkin holders, each a different color, that she had written little notes on. As my father was paying, after loading us into the car, my mom began kicking the gravel around on the drive, absent-minded. The woman came over to say goodbye and to wave to us with her grin, and my mother noticed that she was trying to discreetly recover the tiles that she was uncovering under the gravel. Before driving off, my mother got back out of the car and uncovered one of the tiles, and she claims it was the same pentagram with Third Reich symbol within it that she had seen a similar version of in the park, prompting her to notice as we drove away. The necklace was no longer in her purse either. The likelihood of it simply falling out of the purse pocket that she had placed it in was, as she put it, quite unlikely. People listening to this story seemed appalled at the fact that I still have that little wooden cat that the nice lady gave me sitting in my bedroom. I know this all sounds very strange, but I can only assure you that it matches well with my memory of the events and all the adults who are there to tell the same story, and two of them are not known to exaggerate at all. Personally, I'm glad it's just a weird story we look back on with confusion, and that nothing stranger happened that night. Update. According to my mother, whom I spoke to today, it was near Millbrook, and one was a farm, the other was an old mill. I actually found the website for the B&B. It's still running, but with different owners. I don't know if I should post the link, however. They seem like nice people, who have improved it quite a lot. As for the cats, as a kid, I just thought it was a cool old building with some cats and a nice lady. So I've kept this thing for over 20 years. This happened about three years ago now, but it still kind of freaks me out. This story is kind of long, so please have patience with me. I live with my sister, grandma, and at the time, my childhood dog. All three of us are pretty busy. We all work, and I go to school, so I'm usually out of the house the most. My dog plays a very key role in this story. Sometimes, I even feel like he was telling us something. My house has two floors and a pretty large basement with several rooms. At this point in time, I had my dog for about five years. He has always hated the basement because the steps were too steep for his small legs. He followed me everywhere, but every time I went into the basement, he never followed. One day, I opened the door to go into my basement but then I suddenly remembered I forgot something upstairs. When I came back downstairs to go into the basement, I heard the pitter-patter of my dog's paws hopping down the steps. I was frozen in place. He had never went into the basement before this. I watched 
as he walked down the steps, and when he was at the bottom, he looked at me, happily. I convinced myself that he was just learning new things. A month later, my grandma got very sick. She had to stay in the hospital for a few days, leaving my sister and I alone. I stayed busy with school and working to avoid the feelings of my grandma being absent. One night, I was with my girlfriend. I decided to spend the night since my sister would be staying in the hospital. Around 10.30, my sister called me asking if I had moved her car. I was of course perplexed since I had my own car and had no reason to move hers. Her car was parked in the driveway when I left. It was now parked on the street. Needless to say, I rushed home, obviously fearing for my dog as well as my sister. This is where it starts to get creepy. We opened the door to my house and my dog came running out. This was the first red flag. Every day when we left, we would put him in a locked room. You could only open the door from the outside, meaning someone let him out. Also, our home smelled like cigarettes. None of us smoke. My sister and I walked around the first floor. My basement door was wide open, which it never is since we kept it closed. When I went into the basement, I found cigarette butts in a back room that we hardly go into. They looked old and weathered down, but still pretty recent. However, I think this next part always gets to me the most. I heard my sister screech from the second floor and I went rushing towards her. She was just staring at my room horrified. I was kinda confused until I looked down at the bed. There was a clear indentation in the bed as if someone had just been sitting on the bed. Needless to say, we grabbed our dog packed a few bags, and stayed with some family members instead. When the police came to investigate, they found evidence that someone had been living in my basement for quite some time. They were coming in and out using a cellar door that we never touched. Then it clicked. My dog walked down to the basement because he thought his friend was there. So, to the creepy person who lived in my basement and sat on my bed. Let's not meet. Many moons ago, when I was but a young teenager, I was prone to thinking the best for everyone. What an epic downfall at times. I was lucky though. I had an older, protective brother, a loving mother, and a father who was a cop, so most people didn't mess with me. I met a man through someone I thought was a good friend at a party. Turns out she just loved drinking and was in with some questionable people. This guy was named Tom. He seemed nice enough, charming, handsome, somewhat intelligent. My friend tried to set me up with him, but I wasn't interested. I was the designated driver and was driving my friend home. She invited Tom to come with us, even though I had no desire to bring him home, which would have been very much out of my way, but I was too nice to directly say no, so we all get in my car. I try to drop him off first, but he was being very vague and wanted to go for a drive instead. Red flag, I know that now. My friend was adamant about going home, so I felt forced to drop her off first. Boy, I was a silly young woman. I drop off my friend and end up in what I thought was a nice conversation. He was talking about his ambitions as well as dreams. Something about wanting to work at Disney or as an animator or something. Eventually, I get it out of him where I can drop him off. I remember it being a strange location, but thought nothing more about it. A few days later, I was in her basement at home, 
on the family computer. The days of MSN Messenger and LimeWire. It was late at night. My back was towards all the windows because of the location of the desk. I hear my big brother leave the house to drive his girlfriend home. A few minutes later, the hair on the back of my neck stands up as I hear a tapping at the basement window. I furiously message my friends on MSN, telling them what was going on. I was frozen in place. I didn't want to turn around to potentially see a maniac face framed in the window. My parents were two floors up asleep and I couldn't yell out at them to wake them up without alerting whoever was at the window. The person tapped at every window of the basement. I prayed it was my brother playing a trick on me. To get to those windows, the person would have had to walk up our driveway, through our gate, and around half the house in our backyard. It must have lasted a half hour or longer. Tap, tap, tap. It was horrifying, and I was terrified. What if it wasn't my brother, and he forgot to lock the door when he left? I didn't know what to do. I stayed in my chair until a good hour went by with no noise whatsoever, before I then bolted to my bedroom and locked my door. I stayed awake until I heard my brother come home. The next day, I asked my brother about it. He looked worried and very confused when I explained what had happened. He adamantly refused having played a trick on me, saying he left immediately with his girlfriend. Mom and Dad heard the entire story too. Dad went into full-blown cop mode, interrogating me with fatherly concern. It came out I met that guy, Tom. Dad stopped cooking breakfast and looked intently at me, asking if it was... Tom Smith. I confirmed, yes, it was Tom Smith. He immediately informed me I was to never speak to that person again and cut all ties. He was well known to the police department as being a peeping Tom and having committed break-ins and enters too. Dad suspected it was Tom scouting our place and trying to get my attention when he saw me alone after my brother left. Apparently, my friend told him my phone number and address after that party. I've since cut all ties with her as well. So, peeping Tom, who's named Tom as well, I know we'll never meet again, since I'm pretty sure you're in jail. And let's keep it that way. It started two nights ago. I recently moved back home with my mother. I am from Canada and I have been living halfway across the country and recently moved back. My mom offered me her couch so I could get my feet back under me. Before I went to bed, I was reading a bunch of horror stories, stories about stalkers and watching videos of strange encounters. I eventually fell asleep with my phone in my hand and began to have frightening dreams. I don't remember what they were about. I just remember them making me feel uneasy in my sleep. They don't happen often, but when they do, I can remember more how I felt, rather than the dreams themselves. At around 2am, my sister, 18 years old, woke me up and told me, I heard someone walking outside my window and saw a light flashing directly on me. I wanted to close it, but I couldn't. Can you close it for me? I woke up, terrified, but willing to do anything to protect my sister, and marched to her room. For a little bit of background on me, I'm a 21-year-old male, and my parents are divorced, so it's just my little sister, my mom, and I. Our father was fairly absent in our lives, so I've always been the father figure in her life. Anyway, I go into her room, look out the window, and lock it. We live in a townhouse. My mom and sister sleep downstairs, and I sleep upstairs on the couch. Around the windows, there are rocks 
so it's easy to hear anyone that might come close. Nothing else happens that night. The following day, yesterday, I managed to get to bed. I'm sleeping in my room that night, which is on the same side as my sister's. My mom's room is on the other side of the basement. That night, my sister decided to sleep at her boyfriend's. I always sleep with my window wide open. I am also a light sleeper. At around the same time, I hear the rocks moving. I can tell it is a heavier set person. As it is waking me up, I begin to move. I can hear this person leave the rocks. I was able to tell that it was by her window and not my own. I could also tell that it was a heavier set person due to the way that the rock sounded while moving. I wish I had enough energy to run outside, but sadly, by the time I actually realized that the person was already gone, I'm just so glad my sister wasn't home. I am from Canada in Saskatchewan, and recently, there have been a lot of sex trafficking posts going around. My sister is very beautiful, and I'm worried that that's who has been peering in her window. It could also be an old or a young man creeping on her, or a young child who is curious. Regardless, I made sure to put a wooden stop in her window to make sure it couldn't open enough to let someone in. I also stacked a couple of things in front of the window to make sure that no one else could see in. I also left my window wide open so that if I heard anything, I could be out there in a heartbeat to beat the living crap out of the person who is creeping on my sister. So to the man or woman who is creeping on my baby sister, let's not meet or else you're going to wish we never met. A quick note here from the narrator of this video, the creepy fox, even though this isn't your typical let's not meet story. I decided to include it on today's episode as a break between what you normally hear. So here is that story. I have always loved the outdoors. I was fortunate enough to be born in the great Pacific Northwest, the western Washington Cascades to be exact. My father and I spent much of my early years of life exploring the mountains, fishing, and hunting. There are parts of the Cascades I know like the back of my hand. One of those places is called Goblin Creek. It's up the Index Galama Road off Highway 2. When I was a kid, we would drive up there to do some fishing as well as shooting, but also to collect a specific type of rock that when cut in half and polished would resemble a scenic picture of the view of mountains from within a cave. I do not recall the true name of these stones, we just called them picture rocks. My father's friend and neighbor owned an art gallery slash mineral shop that used to be a church. If you've ever driven through Startup on your way from Sultan to Gold Bar on Highway 2, you might remember seeing the robot sculpture outside the shop that my dad built. This is the place that we sold the stone for $2 a pound. It was lucrative revenue for a preteen. The walk from the creek where we harvested these rocks to the dirt road wasn't particularly long, but lengthy enough that you could presumably get lost while en route if one didn't know where to go. In the years we spent at this creek, I had only ever seen two other people out there. One was a game warden that heard the gunshots from our target practicing session and tracked us down to make sure that everything was fine. The other is the subject of my curiosity. When I was about 14 years old, I distinctly remember hauling a backpack full of these rocks up from the creek to my dad's truck. Along the way, I ran into a man that looked to be about 30 years old. We both appeared to be surprised that we would run into anyone in this rather remote section of the mountains, but as I got closer to this man, he was heading down to the creek, I was heading up the road. He seemed to grow increasingly more startled, as if he was seeing a ghost. 
He didn't say anything as I passed. He just stared at me, seemingly trying to figure out the appropriate words to ask me something. After passing him, I remember thinking how much this guy looked like he could be in my family. The similarities were striking. I continued on to the truck, dumped my load of rock off at the truck, and headed back down to the river to my father. When I arrived, I told him about the encounter and asked him if he had seen this man, to which he replied that no, he hadn't. I have remembered this encounter quite vividly since then. Last year, I was visiting my family in Snohomish and decided to head up to the old Goblin Creek for nostalgic purposes, of course. It had been about 15 years since I was last up there. Along the way up there, I found out that the Index Galema Road had apparently washed out years before. Luckily, I knew of another way up there, via Jack Pass. I found the dirt road and part where my dad used to park and proceeded to walk through the woods down to the creek. Along the way, I saw something that absolutely shook me to the core. As I was about halfway through the woods, I was startled to see someone else coming up from the creek, a boy, about 14 years of age. He was wearing a backpack that looked to be burdened by heavy weights. As we got closer, I began to get increasingly confused and shocked as the boy looked exactly like I did at his age. I meant to say something to him as he passed, but could not figure out the right words to express what I was thinking at that moment. He passed me and kept going. I walked a little ways and finally stopped when it all really hit me. I remember the encounter from my teenage years and realized I just lived the other half of the experience. Both the man and the boy were me, roughly 15 years removed. I turned around to catch up to the boy in the thick western Washington woods. I ran all the way back up to the road where my truck was, to find nothing. There wasn't anywhere else besides the road for him to go to, and I hadn't stalled so long as to not be able to catch up to him. He was just simply gone. Curiosity got the best of me, so I hurried down to the creek, half expecting to find my dad fishing on the bank 15 years younger, but found nobody. I ended up going home and deciding that this experience was too unbelievable to tell even my friends and family. I just wanted to get this out there to the wonderful world of Reddit to see what others think, and hopefully to see if anyone else has had this type of experience as well.